Uh, also what's happening, uh, and Suzanne will talk more about this, is that more work is being done with other communities now, actually continuing with South Madison, but also other communities in Wisconsin. And we're now looking uh, at a few projects, I think, in, uh, in Oregon, uh, on the eastern seaboard in the U.S., and now in Vancouver. So we're kind of actively starting to see projects generated. Now, our challenge, of course, is, not, is maybe to find a way not to be involved in all of those, because <laughs> we only have so much time. Uh, but to get other people interested, as I mentioned, and, and maybe uh, pick up the ball and run with it. So more of a, a broad in the knowledge exchange circle, if you will. Uh, let me come back to this notion of lived experience, um, because in a sense we felt that this is sort of what we were, we were at the center of what uh, we were getting at, what the community was trying to uh, be able to articulate to themselves, to each other, to uh, people in the outside community. You know, what's it like to live here? Good, bad, whatever. Okay, what's the nature of that? And the lived experience of health and place and uh, the intersection between those. So what is that? What forms does that take? Right? Experience. Right? That sounds, that's a nice term, but if you think about it, that obviously needs to be unpacked. Somehow we have to make some choices about what we mean by that. And once you've identified the, uh, its dimensions or its aspects, how do you communicate that to other people? And what methods might, say, from a research point of view, we would use to capture that, or I think a better phrase might be lifted into view. Something that's there, but maybe hard to communicate, but maybe there are methods we can use that people, people themselves can say, well, here, this is what I mean. And then others will say, oh, okay, I get it. Right. And they also maybe in, in, in improves their own self-awareness, their self-understanding, and creates dialogues within the community. So we tried to, uh, we wanted to relate these different aspects of lived experience to different methods. And uh, uh, the way it works out is that if you focus on the left-hand side, we think of the lived experience of space as actually involving at least four things. Uh, and uh, it's probably more complex than that, but uh, we think it involves a sense of place and probably tied to time. Like, where do you do things? and probably where do you do them when, right? Because we know in the different parts of the day we travel and, and uh, we're, in, we're in different locations and there's often time, space routines. Um, so that's an aspect, you know, we can, people can uh, visualize in their heads the sense of, of place, location. The other one is uh, images, like what are the, um, the really uh, meaningful images that people remember when they think about things going on in those places and things that they've done or as they've walked through there. Um, things that are meaningful to them. And events, stuff that actually happened, you know, stuff that happened to them, stuff that they did, um, you know, where they got into trouble, where they had great successes, where they had fun, you know, where they engage in family activities, where they had health problems, all of that, okay all of the experiences of doing things and uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. And then finally, interactions, uh, which is in something we haven't uh, fully developed in, in the projects to date, but it's something we want to, and that uh, essentially the, the other terrain, if you will, is the social terrain, right? So who interacts with who, right? And where and when, right? That's also part of that environment, right? and uh, needing to uh, potentially map that out. And that's an area we'd like to bring in more explicitly in the future. Uh, so there's methods that correspond to this. Uh, and, uh, you know, typically, you know, I'm a social scientist. I'm a sociologist, so what are we famous for? Well, we do surveys, right? And uh, I do them, and uh, sometimes they're useful. But in this case, probably didn't seem that useful. Uh, so in order to get it, the sense of, of location maps seemed intuitively to make sense. And uh, we know that there's strong traditions in other fields like cultural geography, for example, uh, anthropology, where maps, maps are used. And we also knew that they're used in a very applied sense in areas like urban planning, architecture, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so maps became an important kind of method for us, a way of kind of gathering some aspect of lived experience. Images, photography. Put a camera in a kid's hand send them off to take pictures that are meaningful for them. Uh, events. Well, the way human beings talk about events, the way they communicate them is we, they tell stories. I mean, stories essentially are about human action. 
ultimately. Uh, action that they did or action that got done to them and as opposed to just a list of things that uh, went, you know, occurred day, day by day. Um, the actual activity the, of, of, of being an agent in your, in your environment, we, we tend to, in all contexts, tend, I think, use narrative as a way to do that. So interviewing people and getting them to talk about the maps and the photos okay, is a way of kind of pulling that other dimension in. Okay. And finally, the interactions that might probably, one of the ways we could get at that, um, and again, we're still working on this, is network analysis, which is a fairly formal approach that is used in different fields. And essentially is, involves mapping out the relationships, you know, who's, who's tied to who, who's connected to who. Because even in the simplest community, probably what you'll find is there are actually many subgroups. Right? So if, you know, that might be defined, for example, just by, even by age. You know, certain kids hang out with kids of a certain age, you know, and, uh, and that's probably further broken down by you know, race, ethnicity, gender, right? class. Uh, so uh, communities have, have uh, complex sets of networks, and, uh, which I think is, is important to underscore that when, if, when we're talking about communities, including in here, we have to acknowledge that communities themselves are not monolithic things, right? They're actually messy things. And uh, we kind of have to acknowledge that and keep that in mind and uh, sort of capturing that messiness and acknowledging it this is, I think is an important part of, of uh, being able to get somewhere useful with it. Uh, if we start off thinking that they're you know, wonderful, nice, tidy things, we're probably going to close off some possibilities of how we think about them and, and address them. Uh, the nice thing about all of these approaches, at least in terms of the maps, the photography, and the stories, is these, to a certain extent, are things that we're all doing most of the time anyway. Right? You don't have to go take a course in survey methodology or statistics right, to do these. They're also a lot more fun than doing any of those things. Um, you know, we routinely pull out a road map and say, how do I get from here to there? Or which bus do I take to get from here to here? I mean, even kids are doing this. Uh, photography, you know, that's a pretty familiar kind of practice in, in our culture. Storytelling is as old as dirt. That's almost the, one of the defining human characteristics behaviors. Uh, so it's something that we all do and there's something that people can can readily engage in while at the same time actually being quite sophisticated in that they're able to capture these dimensions of something that's probably fairly important, that sense of lived experience. The, uh, this kind of leads us to thinking about layering and where those different kinds of data and means of getting information come together. So. The, uh, the wonderful thing about maps, besides being able to point at them and say, this is where that happened, or this is the route from here to there, or don't go there, is that they provide a kind of a foundation to build on, right? So they're, the language of mapping, if you talk to people in, uh, that work in GIS, they'll start to use this word layering. Right? So they're saying, oh, we'll layer, we'll put that layer on. Right? We'll add this other information, that's another layer. And so it gives you a very handy way, it kind of gives you a grid, if you will, to kind of put stuff on that you can vertically then relate down and link things. So uh, a map is a good place to start. And uh, so you could imagine laying, rolling out a map or, or doing one online and uh, saying, uh, you know, okay, there's the layout of uh, my community or your community. And uh, okay, so what can we put on there? Well, we could put places on there and pathways and that sort of information, very locational stuff. We could even put time stuff on there. Uh, uh, cultural geographers uh, do some time-space mapping where they're able to kind of show the cycles by which people move through at different points in the, in the, in the, uh, the daily uh, routine or the weekly routine. Um, so we can do that, but it also builds a nice foundation for other stuff. Uh, there's some kids, I think this, is this South Madison, Suzanne? No. One of the other Mad Wisconsin communities. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So this is some kids working with, a, with a, a map they're developing of their, their neighborhood. So that's sort of the beginning of that bottom layer in the process. So, and uh, they're able to get quite engaged in it, and this is at a, at a pretty young age. So uh, 